Well, it's our privilege to have Ken Ramey with us here uh, this morning, and he and his wife Kelly have been with us all weekend long, and if you've had a chance to come, uh, you've already been blessed yesterday. We heard a primer on prayer, and we're looking forward to what he has uh, for us today. But Ken serves as the pastor-teacher of Lakeside Bible Church, born and raised in Massachusetts. Ken attended Word of Life Bible Institute and School of Youth Ministries in New York and then transferred to the Master's College in Los Angeles, California, where he graduated with a bachelor's degree in youth ministry. He went on to receive his MDiv from the Master's Seminary and joined the pastoral staff at Grace Community Church, where he served as the high school pastor for four years and as professor of youth ministry at the Master's College. He also completed his uh, D-man and expository preaching at the Master's Seminary. Ken and his wife Kelly were married in 1990, and have three children, Zachariah, Hannah, and Jacob. And again, we know Ken from afar because we have studied his book, Expository Listening. If you were in the men's study uh, earlier this year, you went through that book, and I've had the opportunity to go through it with several men. And I can, uh, the book itself is just every Christian needs to read the book uh, because it will have eternal impact uh, as we learn how to listen to the preaching of God's Word. And so as we learn, again, we're continuing to grow. And I think of all the messages that I have that I have heard in my life and how I have not put that to practice. And so the book was just so pivotal and impactful for me and I know for many of you. But we are grateful to have Ken and Kelly here with us this morning. And so, Ken, uh, why don't you come up and share with us? Okay, we can give Thank you. Um, Ron, thank you. You're so kind, and uh, we thoroughly uh, enjoyed uh, getting to know Ron and Rachel and, and uh, Chris and his wife and the elders and their wives. Uh, you are blessed as a body to have the leadership that you have. Uh, feel very like minded with them, uh, doctrinally and philosophically, and uh, just have so much in common. And so I just want to commend them to you uh, that you are. Uh, a blessed congregation. The Lord has uh, showed His favor upon this church and upon this congregation to have raised up the type of men uh, that uh, He has leading you, shepherding you. And uh, it seems to me, uh, while there's no perfect church and there's no perfect pastors or elders, um, that uh, you're going to be just fine here. And uh, the Lord has been good. It seems appropriate that as uh, a former youth pastor, or we're down here at the youth pit, <laughs> as we used to call it, close by with the wafting of donuts in the air, it just seems uh, the only thing that would make it better would be some pizza, right? Now. Just, uh, kind of round the whole experience out. But uh, anyway, it's good to be with you, and uh, thank you so much for your attentiveness to the Word. I did, I did uh, mention to the, to the guys last night when we were having dinner that you truly are expository listeners. I mean, you are very attentive uh, to the teaching of God's Word, uh, which is a testimony and just an evidence of God's grace uh, in your life. And so, uh, this morning, I'd like you to take your Bibles and turn, me, turn with me to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, and we're going to look at what I assume would be a very familiar text to all of you. And uh, I would say this, second only to Jesus, uh, Paul is the best example of a man of prayer anywhere in the New Testament. And yesterday we looked at the pattern of prayer that Jesus laid out for us, the model prayer, the Lord's Prayer, or maybe better uh, titled the Disciples' Prayer, uh, and just gave us uh, kind of a pattern to follow, an outline to follow. In fact, I received uh, from uh, one of the gentlemen of the church today uh, an outline that he uses as he prepares uh, to pray, uh, to do the congregational prayer that he has for years apparently uh, just uh, put the outline of the Lord's Prayer on the left hand margin and he just fills in the gaps, fills in uh, the different pieces uh, and, and puts his own words in where uh, Jesus uh, told us how to, to pray. I thought what a practical way to apply that. And so I told him I was going to stick it on my notes and use it in the future as an example of a way to apply that. So we looked at Jesus' example uh, yesterday, this morning I want to look at Paul's example, uh, because I, again, I think he is probably the best example, second only to Christ, in the New Testament about being a man of prayer. And so we're going to look at one of his many prayers uh, that he prayed uh, here in Colossians chapter 1. 
Let me just read our text, verses 9 through 14, for you. Paul writes, For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to please Him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power according to His glorious might, for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. For He rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Let's pray. Father, we uh, always want to pause before we uh, begin to um, expound on your word. And, and uh, Lord, we desperately need your spirit now to illuminate our minds to understand what Paul wrote here. And ultimately what your spirit wrote here uh, through Paul. And, uh, and, and also, Lord, to make application of it in our lives. Lord, we don't want to just be merely hearers of the word who delude ourselves, deceive ourselves. We want to be uh, those who put it into practice, who do what it says. And so help us to see uh, the connection between what it says and how it applies to our lives this morning. And so bless our time, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I don't need to tell you that we live in the most technologically advanced age in the history of mankind. And uh, we have cell phones and laptops and gaming stations and iPads and satellite TV and DVRs and Blu-ray and social media and et cetera, et cetera. All of the things, by the way, didn't exist when I was a kid. I'm just dating myself a bit there. Um, but one of the greatest blessings of all this new technology is the amazing ability that we have now to interact with one another and stay connected to people all over the world. I remember the first time I... Uh, traveled to India back in the 1990s, I had to, in order to talk to my wife, I had to find one of these little booths on the side of the road and pay some guy $15 uh, just to talk to my wife for five minutes on this crackly line. And, uh, and now when I go to India, I just take out my phone or my iPad or my laptop and I just hit FaceTime and, and we're having a face-to-face -face conversation anytime we want, as long as we want, and it's all for free. And uh, so I'm very grateful for uh, these modern technologies. And so, um, as, as Christians, we, we have to understand, however, that, that we've always had something that is a far greater blessing than things like email and uh, the ability to text and, and FaceTime and Skype. Um, more than any of these other technological advances that we have now, or even may come in the future, and what I'm referring to is we've we have prayer. And prayer provides us the amazing ability to intercede for and stay connected with other Christians, brothers and sisters of Christ, all over the world. And yet, unfortunately, I think that intercessory prayer gets overshadowed or supplanted or even replaced by all these new advances in technology. What I'm saying is, for example, do you pray for your family members and friends as much as you email them or text them or chat with them online or check out their Facebook page or play video games if you're a young person, right? How, how long are you playing video games with your friends and how long are you interceding for your friends, praying for your friends? There's nothing more important that we can do for one another than to pray. And, and through, through prayer, we are able to minister to each other without even seeing or speaking to one another. Prayer enables us to have a significant role in one another's lives, supporting each other and seeking God's blessing on each other's lives, even those that we may have never even met. How cool is that? See, Paul had never met the believers in Colossae. But while he was under house arrest in Rome, he received a visit from a man named Epaphras, who Paul had likely led to Christ during his ministry days in, in the city of Ephesus, and, uh, and then sent him out to evangelize Colossae and plant a church there. Look at verse 7. 
Just as you learned, just as you learned it from Epaphras talking about the gospel, our beloved fellow bond servant who is a faithful servant of Christ on our behalf. So Epaphras said, "Come and visited Paul while he was under house arrest, and informed Paul that that the Colossians had understood and embraced." The truth of the gospel, which was evidenced by the Holy Spirit producing in them uh, the appropriate fruits of repentance and namely faith, love, and hope. Look at verse 4 here, just to get the context here. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel which has come to you just as in all the world, also it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing even as it's been doing in you also since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God and truth. So Papyrus was giving this update to Paul. Uh, unfortunately, he also had to report that there were some false teachers who had moved into Colossae and were threatening to unsettle the faith of these brand new believers. And uh, they may have begun to doubt what they had been taught, if they had truly heard the true gospel. Maybe, maybe they were even fearing that they weren't truly saved. And so Paul immediately added them to his prayer list and rightly interceded for them during the, his times of prayer. Notice verse 3. We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. And then of course verse 9, we've already read for this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you. So Paul had gotten into the habit of praying for the Colossians. And he prayed unceasingly, continuously, which was Paul's habit for all the churches that he ministered to. Uh, listen to a, a couple other letters that he wrote. The letter he wrote to the believers in Rome, Rome, chap Rome Romans chapter 1, uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 9 and 10. He says, For God whom I serve in my spirit in the preaching of the gospel of the Son is my witness as to how unceasingly I make mention of you always in my prayers making you rest. If perhaps now that at last by the will of God I may succeed in coming to you. He exhorted the believers in, in Ephesus to do the same thing with all prayer. Verse 18, this is of, of Ephesians 5, 6, 6, 18. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with all this of you, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. But of course we all know 1 Thessalonians 5, 7, 17. Pray without love. Ceasing. And so Paul was in the habit of praying unceasingly for not just the Colossians, but uh, all the churches that he had uh, been a part of. And so here in this letter that he wrote to the church in Colossae after his customary introduction, he, re he reassured them that Epaphras was a faithful representative of the gospel, that they had heard the true gospel, and that they were true Christians. And then he tells them, not just that he's praying for them, but he tells them exactly what he was praying for them. And again, this was very typical of Paul's letters. And I think you're aware of this, that he often began his letters by telling people not just that he was praying for them, but exactly what he was praying for them. For example, uh, you can look at Ephesians chapter 1, uh, verse 15. For this reason, I too, having heard of, of the faith in the Lord Jesus which exists among you and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation and of knowledge of Him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of His calling and what are the riches of His glory and His inheritance of the saints and what is the surpassing greatness of His power towards us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of His might which He brought about in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at the right hand of the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion in every name that is named not only in this age but also in the one to come. That's a chunk of prayer right there. And he goes on, even in uh, that later in that letter, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14. 
For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from every from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives his name, that he would grant you, and here he's going to give you his prayer list, according to the riches of his glory, be strengthened with power through the spirit of the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints, what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. And again, in Philippians, Philippians chapter 1, verse 9. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve the things that are excellent, in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes through Jesus Christ in the glory and praise of God. So all that being said, as you are wondering how to fill up that hour, that Mike just challenged us to think about maybe praying for an hour. Well, well, that's a long time. What am I going to say? Well, if you don't know what to say, maybe you could just uh, quote the Apostle Paul. And go to these, these prayers of intercession. And uh, what's different to me about these prayers than the Lord's Prayer, the Lord's Prayer was never intended for us to be recited verbatim. Not that it would be wrong to do that necessarily, but uh, it was more of a pattern, it was more of an example. Whereas I think we could parrot these prayers of Paul. We, we could pray these prayers specifically, verbatim. Uh, we could just read these prayers and turn them into our own prayers, borrowing the words of the Apostle Paul as we intercede and pray for one another. Now, again, Paul's prayers serve as examples of both how we should pray, but also what we should pray for. And, and if you were to analyze all of these prayers that I just read, they, they really come down to two things. There's, there's basically two requests. There's a request for knowledge, and there's a, re a request for conduct. In other words, he was praying for what people would know, and he was praying for how they would live. And so if I could say it simply, I think Paul's basic prayer for those he prayed for was that they would know what God wanted them to know so they could be who God wanted them to be. That's a prayer that I often pray for for our congregation on Sunday morning, even as I open up a text and I read the text and, and then I pray and I say, Lord, would you help us to know all that you want us to know from this text so that we can be all that you want us to be. And so Paul's prayer here in Colossians chapter 1, uh, for the believers in Colossians, it consists of five requests. Five requests that should be on all of our prayers regarding every Christian that we pray for, including ourselves. Okay? And, and Mike was talking about yesterday the importance of lists, that one of the, the, the most basic uh, ways to improve your prayer life, one of the quickest ways to improve your prayer life, is to have a list. Because typically, right, we go to prayer, we bow our heads, and next thing you know, man, we're either dozing off or our minds are off racing around the, 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 what our next responsibility is, what we got going that day. And so it helps to have a guide, a list, something that we can walk our way through. And so uh, if you don't have a prayer list, um, you're wondering, well, where do I start? Well, here you go. Here, here's a prayer list uh, that you can use as you intercede for others. And this is really a one size fits all for every Christian. This is, a, this is a prayer for every Christian. Every Christian should pray this prayer for themselves and also for every other Christian they know. And so there, these, 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 are, these are the five things, if you will, that every Christian desperately needs in order to live a life that is pleasing to the Lord. And, and I want you to note here, just as we begin, all of these requests are spiritual in nature. There's nothing here about Aunt Abel's ingrown toenail, okay? And I, I say that because, at least if, if your church is like our church, and I think like a lot of churches, whenever we have an opportunity to share prayer requests, typically, what comes up? Typically, it's the, the stuff right on the surface. It's the physical and material needs that we have. And, and, and so the main focus, and 
primary concern of most prayer meetings in churches are, are medical and financial problems. And it's not wrong to pray for our physical and material needs. We, we should do that. But since spiritual needs are far more important, I think they should occupy the main portion of our private and our corporate prayer times. And again, I, I think if, if there is a, a, a physical need, uh, you can always turn that physical request, that press, request for physical help, into a request for spiritual help. And I don't know if the, the members of our body uh, appreciate this, but typically if I go visit them in the hospital and they're laying there in bed having just about to go into surgery or just coming out of surgery or whatever, uh, I'll, I'll typically pray for their physical need. I'll pray for the doctor that he would have, have wisdom in, in all the decisions and incisions that he makes that day and uh, that, that the Lord would provide healing and, and protection. But I always end up praying, Father, I, I ask that you would use this physical trial to fill up where they're lacking in their faith that they may, would be mature and complete lacking nothing. Because ultimately, right, it's not what's going on physically that matters. It's what's going on spiritually. God is using whatever physical, material need you have, financial crisis you have, uh, to, to grow you spiritually. And so, what are these five things that Paul prayed for? And just quickly, he prayed for spiritual wisdom and understanding. He prayed for their, their spiritual conduct and behavior. He, he prayed for spiritual growth and fruit. He prayed for spiritual strength and power. And he prayed for spiritual gratitude or thankfulness. Now, that doesn't sound very practical, so let me give you uh, a, a list, I guess, uh, practically speaking, what are we to pray for other Christians? When we're praying for other Christians, what should we ask God to do? Okay? Number one, we should ask God to help them to fully comprehend His will for their lives. It's the first prayer request on your list, your prayer list, your List in an intercession. Help them to fully comprehend His will for their lives. Notice verse 9. For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. <clears throat> By the way, Paul used the same words here that the false teachers were throwing around. Um, the words fullness and knowledge and wisdom and understanding. Apparently they were promoting some early form of Gnosticism, which was, uh, which they said was, was true spirituality um, that could only be achieved by attaining some higher level of knowledge or this gnosis, that's where the word Gnosticism comes from. And, and so they had suddenly introduced this idea uh, that beyond the essentials of Christ, that, that Epaphras had taught them, that the Colossians needed something more. They needed to go to the next level in order to experience the fullness of God in their lives. So it was more this, this kind of mystical enlightenment that they were promoting. Which, by the way, sounds very common today, doesn't it? Uh, there are many false teachers today who give Christians the impression that their lives will never really count for the Lord until they have a certain mystical experience or acquire some spiritual gift. Uh, like, you need to be baptized by the Holy Spirit. Uh, you need to have the gift of tongues. And I'll never forget a guy coming up to me one time, a, a guy that I knew, and he was a, a well-intended uh, guy. I, I don't know if he was a true believer or not, but I remember he came from a charismatic church, and he, he came up to me one time, with great concern and he grabbed a hold of my hand and he said brother I am praying that you repent and receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and I was like well hey listen I really appreciate your concern for me but just so you know I already have been baptized by the Holy Spirit and it happened when I got saved and it ain't going to happen again okay and I have everything I need in Christ right now with the word of God right the spirit of God in me and, and so don't let people pressure you that somehow you're somehow spiritually second rate. You're just a JV Christian. You need to go to the next level be a varsity Christian. And you need this baptism of the Holy Spirit. You need to have this experience, right? What a, based on what Paul said here, we don't need some fresh spiritual experience. We need to grow in the one that we already have. 
We don't need some new knowledge. We need, we need to more fully understand what we already know. And that's what he meant by that you would be filled with the knowledge of his will. To be completely filled or totally controlled by what you know. We, we understand this word being filled by being filled with anger or being filled with fear or filled with joy. Uh, it, it means being controlled by, being, being filled with the Holy Spirit, right? Ephesians chapter 5, 18, being controlled by the Holy Spirit. And again, we don't have time to look at this, but if you're familiar with the book of, of, of Colossians, uh, this was a theme, especially here in the first and second chapters, uh, this whole idea of filling and fullness and just one example, verse 9 of chapter 2. For in Christ all the, what? Fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. And so he was he was playing off the false teachers. And what they were, they were trying to convince the, the believers of there. So notice he says that you would be filled with the knowledge of his will. This is the word epignosis in the Greek. And, and Paul, the word for knowledge is typically gnosis, and he added this, this preposition, epi-gnosis, to intensify the meaning of the knowledge he was referring to. This is, this is deep, thorough knowledge. And this is what he prayed for in Ephesians chapter 1. This is what he prayed for in Philippians chapter 1 as well. And these other prayers that I already prayed are already read for you. Uh, again, Paul wasn't praying that they would receive some kind of new knowledge but that they would more fully grasp what they already knew to be the will of God for their life. And that's something every one of us as Christians needs to know. We need to know God's will for our life. Now, Paul wasn't referring to God's decretive will, which is like what he's decreed for the foundation of the earth, like where you're going to go to college, who you're going to marry, what job you're going to take, what church you're going to go. I mean, it's, it's, oh, that's yeah, the decree of will. That's not our business, right? God will work that out in his way in his time. I think what Paul was referring to here is God's directive will. In other words, namely, how God wants us to live our life. This is God's will, by the way, right here. It's not lost. You don't have to find it, right? It's right here. This is how God directs our lives and shows us His will through His Word. So the Spirit of God illuminates our minds so we understand God's Word, which reveals God's will for our lives. So He's praying, God, would, would, would you fill them with the knowledge of His will, your will, in all spiritual wisdom and understanding? And I think these two words, wisdom and understanding, refer to the comprehension of and application of God's Word. And uh, by the way, I was just uh, meeting with some brand new believers and I'm doing their premarital counseling and, and uh, the gal was just talking about this new Bible study that she, the woman's Bible study she just started going to at this other church. Uh, and she said, God, yeah, I've never really, she comes from a Catholic background, she goes, well, we've never studied the Bible this way before, where, where you actually you know, sit down and they ask, they ask you to, to do these things, and you have to like, there's a comprehension section, and then there's an interpretation section, and then there's a, let me see, what was it? I think it's called application section, and I was like, that is, I was like, that is so awesome. I said, not only are you, are you, studying God's Word, but they're teaching you how to study God's Word. Observation, interpretation, application, observation, interpretation, application for those Word of Lifers here. I already met a few of you. Uh, and we cut our teeth on that at Word of Life. Right? Every day we're having our quiet time diary. Every, everything stopped on the campus and they everyone sat down from the president to the custodian right? right? And, and every student and professor we stopped and we had our quiet time and, and they gave us these little diaries and, and the question was always what does it say? Then you write that down. Read it first. What does it say? Second, or, or then you, the second question was, what does it mean? And the third question was, how does it apply? And I didn't even realize at the time that I was being taught how to study the Bible. Right? Observation, interpretation, application. So this is, I think, the idea here in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Paul wanted the Colossians not just to understand God's will, but to live it out. He, didn't, he, wanted to have, he wanted them to have more than just a bunch of head knowledge. Which, by the way, churches like ours, that's probably the biggest danger. That we just, we just produce a bunch of Bible heads. We all have all this information, right? But we're not doing anything about it. It's not changing the way we live our lives. 
And so, really the difference between knowledge, which he's praying for, but then moving on to wisdom, is, you know, knowing something and doing something are two different things, right? In fact, if you don't do something, you can't say you really know it. There needs to be a connection between what we know and how we live our lives. And I love that Alistair Begg's um, little tagline for his Truth for Life radio program. Some of you, I'm sure, listen to him. Uh, where the learning is for living. You, you remember that? Where the learning is for living. So, the point is, I think that there tends to be an unhealthy dichotomy in the lives of a lot of Christians, who, who, or at least those who profess to be Christians. Um, how they live their life doesn't match up with what they know. I remember watching the royal weddings that were, you know, that was a big deal. I was so, sh honestly, shocked at how crazy Americans got to, to watch the royal weddings. And I know, I've seen some of the young ladies just like, oh, it's like a fairy tale wedding, right? That's why it was so fun for you to watch. But it was, uh, it, it, was it was shocking to me. I had really never listened to any, uh, any, any messages or, or services from these, these old uh, historic cathedrals, Westminster Chapel and, and uh, the other, uh, I can't remember, the St. George's uh, thing where they got, the most recent couple got married. But you listen to the service and man, they're reading the Bible. And they're, they're giving, a, a, they're presenting a biblical view of marriage. And all the songs that they sang and, and, and the, the, even the message that was, I'm like, oh, wow, this, I'm good with all that. But then you look at the royal family and you see just how they not necessarily live that out and practice that. I'm thinking, okay, this is, this is a problem, right? People know the truth, they have the truth, but it doesn't make a difference in their lives. And so, what did Paul pray? Paul was praying here that God would, God would help them to fully comprehend His will for their life. That's something we need to pray for ourselves and we also pray for others. Secondly, Paul prayed that God would enable them to be pleasing to Him with their lives. And so that's really what we were just talking about, but, but that God would enable them to be pleasing to Him with their lives. And, and this is a very familiar phrase in Paul's writings. In verse 10, so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please Him in all respects. To walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. The word walk obviously means to live, to live in a manner worthy of the Lord. This is talking about your conduct, the, your behavior, the way you live your life should be consistent with who you are in Christ. Um, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, the, the pivotal verse in the, the book, the hinge of, of the first three chapters, moving from the, from the uh, uh, basically the, the, the doctrinal section in, in chapter 1 through 3 to the practical applicational section in chapters 4 through 6. He says this, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called. Philippians 1.27 only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. 1 Thessalonians 2.12. Again, Paul up this expression so that you would walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. In other words, Paul's just saying, listen, if you're a Christian, act like one. And if you're not willing to act like one, don't call yourself one because you're making the rest of us who are trying to live it out look bad. Walk in a manner that's worthy of the Lord. And so if you truly know Christ, live like Christ, talk like Christ, act like Christ, smell like Christ. You fill in the blank, right? Just be like Jesus. Accurately represent Him in this world. So Paul says that they would walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please Him in all respects. The goal of every Christian should be to live a life that is pleasing to the Lord. I love 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. Paul said, I make it my ambition when they're home or absent to be what? Well. To be pleasing to the Lord. That is the ultimate goal for every Christian. That's the highest goal. That we would be pleasing to the Lord. Our natural tendency is to please who? 
ourselves, and also sometimes to please what? Others, to be people pleasing. Years ago, I did a little study on this concept of pleasing the Lord, and I came up with this little, I don't know, for lack of a better term, a little devotional, and I, I keep it in the front of my Bible, and uh, I guess I keep it there in case I ever am somewhere, and uh, the preacher goes down and they need somebody to fill the pulpit really quick, I can whip this out, and I, I, this is what I would preach, and so I've got a whole other message here, uh, but I don't want to take all the time to do it, but it's just three, the way I thought through logically, and what the, I looked up all the scriptures about pleasing the Lord in the New Testament, and it just seemed to break down like this. Number one, my daily passion is to be pleasing to the Lord. John 5.30, Jesus said, I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. John 8.29, Jesus said, I always, I always do the things that are pleasing to him. Uh, 1 Corinthians 7.32, one who is unmarried is concerned about the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. Um, 1 Thessalonians 4.1, finally, brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus, that as you receive from us instruction as how you want to walk and please the Lord. 2 Timothy 2.4, no soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life, so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. So my daily passion is to be pleasing to the Lord. And so if that's my daily passion, that needs to be my daily pursuit to find out what is pleasing to the Lord. Okay? If that's my goal, to be pleasing to the Lord, I've got to know what that is. How do I know what is pleasing to the Lord? Romans 12, 1 and 2. Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. <clears throat> Ephesians 5, 8. For you were formerly in darkness. But now you're in light. Walk as children of light, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. So this is a process. We don't automatically know what pleases the Lord. We've got to study His Word, right? That's how we know what pleases and displeases. And so we need to find this out. Uh, Hebrews 13, 16, do not neglect doing good and sharing for, such, for with such sacrifice God is pleased. So that's, that's our pursuit, our daily pursuit. So my daily passion, my daily pursuit, and then thirdly, my daily prayer. Okay, so you can pursue these things all you want to find out what is pleasing the Lord. Ultimately, you need to pray that the Lord will work in you that which is pleasing to Him. And I love, I love uh, Hebrews 13, verse 20. Now the God of peace, who brought us up from the dead, the great shepherd of the sheep, the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus Christ our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do as well, working in us that which is pleasing in His sight. Through Jesus Christ, we the glory forever and ever. Amen. And so ultimately, we cannot please the Lord in our own strength and our own wisdom. He must do that, right? He must, he must work in us that which is pleasing to the Lord. And so we please the Lord in total dependence on Him in prayer. And so Paul was praying here simply that, that they would enable, that God would enable them to be pleasing to Him with, with their lives. Number three, he prayed that God would cause them to grow and bear much fruit in their lives. That God would cause them to grow and bear much fruit in their lives. Notice again verse 10. Bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Now, obviously, I don't need to tell you this. You've been well taught that good works don't save you. But they prove that you're saved, right? Right? I love Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace you are saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast. We got that verse, but we got to connect it with the next verse, which says in verse 10, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, right? That He's foreordained that we should walk in them. So we're not saved by good works. We're saved for good works. And the Bible makes it very clear that that you will know if someone's saved by their, well, fruit. By the fruit of them. Look, look at the works. Again, they're not saved by, you know, we're not saved by works, but it does give evidence of whether or not the Spirit of God is at work in us. And, and fruit will only be produced in our lives when we are abiding in Christ. John chapter 15 uh, talks about that. About it, 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 it glorifies God when we Abide in Christ, and we produce much fruit. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. 
We also need to be filled with the Spirit, right? So that we can have the fruit of the Spirit, which is what? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, right? Self-control. You know that list. And so he's praying that they would bear fruit and they would increase in the knowledge of God. And so as we exercise this dependent discipline in diligently studying God's word and obediently applying God's word to our lives and faithfully serving God, God will grant us continued growth and maturity. God will reveal to us a new aspect of himself and his will for our lives through his word and, and help us conform our lives to it so we can even become more pleasing to the Lord. You know how that works, right? As you have grown in Christ, you know, the Lord shows you something in His Word, and you're like, oh, I never saw that before, or I never thought about how that might apply to this area of my life. And, you know, I think that area of my life needs to change. I need to either start doing that, or I need to stop doing that. And so you continue to grow, increase in your knowledge of God. The fourth request here, the fourth request that Paul made was that God would strengthen them to endure the difficulties in their lives. That God would strengthen them to endure the difficulties in their lives. Notice verse 11. Strengthened with all power according to His glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience. Paul was talking about power here, which was one of his favorite prayer requests that the Believers would have power. They would understand the power that they have in Christ. The same power that God used to raise Christ from the dead, right? According to this glorious might, it says, in, in other words, in, in proportion to the one supplying the power. We, we have an unlimited supply of power as believers. And so Paul prayed that they, that they would experience the power of the risen Lord Jesus Christ working in and through their lives. And... But notice, it, Paul didn't want them to have this power so they could perform miracles or speak in tongues or cast out demons or heal sick people. That wasn't where the power was to come to bear. God's power was intended for practical, down-to-earth Christian living. Namely, to endure joyfully difficult situations and difficult people. Notice he says... Strength of all power according to his glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience. <clears throat> steadfastness means perseverance, endurance, remaining under some difficult weight. You're able to experience bitter disappointments and painful losses and just keep running going. You don't give up, you don't lose heart. Galatians 6 9, don't grow weary in well doing. For if you remain Constant, patient, you will reap a harvest if you do not quit. James 1, let endurance have its perfect work, right? Uh, in the midst of trials. Blessed are they who endure, James 5, 11. So he prays for steadfastness, he prays for patience, which by the way, you don't ever need to pray for patience because God will you know, answer that prayer really quickly, right? Be careful about praying for patience. But the idea here is that, that we would be able to remain gentle and calm and sweet when dealing with difficult people. The ability to show self-restraint that you don't get mad easily or seek revenge. I love Proverbs 19.11, it is to your glory to overlook an offense. In other words, don't be easily offended. Don't be that person that everybody's got to like walk around you, you know, with, deal with you with kid gloves and they're like walking around on eggshells around you because then they're easily offended. Don't be that person. So pray that you would be that person. So the idea here is that, that, that God's supernatural power works would work mightily within us, enabling us to endure the difficulties that He ordains for our lives and to not endure them begrudgingly but joyously. Notice he says joyously there at the end of verse 11. One commentator said this, what kind of power would you prefer? The ability to produce a spectacular miracle in front of a crowd of thousands or the ability to live out a whole lifetime without letting Jesus down? I'll take that. You leave the miracle to somebody else, right? So the last request here, number five, make, he prayed that God would make them thankful that he has redeemed their lives. 
that God would make them thankful that he has redeemed their lives. Notice he said, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share the inheritance of the saints in light, for he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. In other words, what should we be most thankful for? Our salvation. And when we remember that, right, when we are continually, constantly, forefront of our minds, just, just grateful that I'm saved, just I'm so thankful that I'm a child of God, Everything else in life kind of pales in comparison, doesn't it? You can deal with anything when you remember that. And so there's lots of things we can say about this section here. But for the sake of time, let's just say, um, is this what your prayer list looks like, sounds like? Is this, are these the kind of prayers that are coming out of your mouth for other people? And for yourself. I mean, what more could anyone want or need than these things right here? I mean, this pretty much covers everything. And, and maybe just in closing, I would just ask you this, okay? We said, hey, this is how you should pray for others. But let me ask you this. Is your life an answer to Paul's prayer? Is your life an answer to this prayer? Do you fully comprehend God's will for your life? Are you walking worthy and pleasing Him with your life? Are, is God growing you and producing fruit in your life? Are you patiently and joyously enduring trials in your life with the strength that God provides? And are you truly thankful that He's redeemed your life? I challenge you this morning to make it your goal to pray for your family members, your friends, your pastors, your missionaries, right? Intercede for them more than you do anything else with them. Whether it's emailing them, texting them, FaceTiming them, playing video games with them, if you do. Our kids, our boys, play video games with their friends in Dubai. It's crazy. But hey, are we praying for one another? These kinds of things. Let me pray. Father, thank you so much for this time we've had together to look at Paul's example and uh, to look at this prayer that we can turn into our own prayer. And so Lord, help us as we uh, grow in our ability to intercede for one another that these would be the kinds of prayers that we would pray and Lord, these would be the kind of uh, answers to prayer that we experience. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, thank you, Ken, very much. Uh, what a blessing and a very helpful, practical things there for us to to take from Colossians. And uh, now we got to go from here and, and do those things. And so I, that'll be our prayer: is that we take what we hear, uh, we've heard this morning, and that we would go and do uh, what we've heard. So thank you so much. Very helpful, helpful things. Well, we need to grab a donut, grab a cup of coffee. And uh, head upstairs. We're not done. So we have uh, much more. And so I appreciate you guys coming. Let me close us in prayer. And then we're going to move upstairs and make room for the next group to come down here. So thank you again. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you so much for uh, what we've heard this morning. And I just pray that this would be our prayer. Uh, that we would take Paul's prayer and, and that it would be ours and that that our life will be a reflection of this prayer. Uh, and not only will we pray this for others, but that we would live this out. So I pray that we would structure our lives in a way that we would be praying for others more than we are doing other things with them. And that we would be consistent in praying for them, praying for the, their spiritual health, and more importantly than, than anything else. So I thank you uh, for, again, this, this day and the opportunity to gather together as believers here and to hear the truths of your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah.